something. All right, any questions? We're getting into Hebrews chapter 6. So, therefore, what's that therefore? On the basis of what has just been said, right? Leaving the discussion of the elementary principles. Now, this word here, elementary principles, is not the same word that was used in verse 12 of chapter 5. The first principles. Remember, this was stoichion. <clears throat> However, since it's in the same context, I think it's referring to the same thing. So we they're going to leave the elementary principles of Christ and the elementary principles of Christ was found in the old covenant law. So they had to move on to perfection. So he says, let us go on to perfection. That is a tell word. Teleos or telos, telos. And it just means um, maturity or completion. So they're going to leave these elementary principles and they're going to go on to perfection. Now the elementary principles were the very things that were taught in the law. Where do we first learn about faith? Where do we first learn about faith? Isn't it from the Old Covenant? Yeah, I was going to say. Um, Where do we learn about repentance? Psalms 51. David repenting. That's in the law. Where do we learn about um, eternal judgment? Where do we learn about anything? We first read about it in that Old Covenant law. So since the book of Hebrews is a book about leaving the law and going on to perfection, that would be Christianity, the elementary principles of Christ, that's the Old Covenant law. And it was the Old Covenant law that spoke about the coming Messiah and his kingdom. It's the Old Covenant law that they learned that they ought to have faith in their coming Messiah. <clears throat> so this may seem to be talking about, well, the things of Christianity. No, yeah, yes and no. So let's look at this. He says, as they go on to perfection, they're not going to lay again the foundation of repentance. For actually from dead works. Let's grab that whole phrase. Repentance from dead works. Well, where do you learn about repentance from dead works? That's in the law. We learn about repentance in the law. The dead works are the dead works of the law. Where do we learn about faith toward God? That's under the law. Where do we learn about the doctrine of baptisms? This isn't Christian baptism, by the way. That's the Jewish Washings that are under the law. These are the uh, the cleansing rites that pointed to something. So, um, do you guys want to go into this further? Do you want to look at some of these things, or do you want to move on? Uh, so, I've got in my notes um, everywhere that the law talks about. Well, not everywhere, but there's some references about the, the baptisms, about the washings, the ceremonial washings of the Jews. Um, we can go back and we can learn from the law about repentance of dead works. I think that's the dead works of the law because now, now that faith has come, now that the gospel has come, these, these dead works needed to be repented from <clears throat> and they needed to come out from under the dead works of the law, and they needed to have faith toward God. Now the doc now so so all of these things pointed forward to the realities of the gospel. <clears throat> and the doctrine of baptisms is not 
This is not anything Christian here, per se. I believe this is referring to the, the baptismal washings, the plungings, the dippings, if you want to call them that, or the immersions under the Old Covenant law for ceremonial cleansing. So when the priests came in, do you remember when Solomon built the temple, <clears throat> he built what was called the brazen seat. Do you remember that? If you go and you read uh, second, um, second something, Chronicles, there you go. I was going to say Corinthians, but I didn't want Corinthians. It, it's second Chronicles. I think it's Second Chronicles. Let me turn there. Yeah. Um, Six or seven? Yeah, it's actually, we're going to look at the furnishings of the temple, which is Second Chronicles chapter 4. Yep. And then I'm looking for Solomon making the brazen sea. Which I think is going to be. Um, he makes the carts. He makes the pillars. Oh, yeah, ch chapter four and verse six. So look at Second Chronicles chapter four. Actually, we'll we'll come back up to verse three. Actually, we'll ah, verse one. Let's just go back. To verse one. So moreover, he made a bronze altar. Twenty cubits was its length. 20 cubits its width and 10 cubits its height. Then he made the sea. You see that? Of cast bronze. 10 cubits from one brim to the other. It was completely round. Its height was 5 cubits and a line of 30 cubits measured its cir circumference. And under it was the likeness of oxen encircling it all around. Ten to a cubit and all the way around the sea, the oxen were cast in two rows when it was cast. <clears throat> it stood on twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, three looking toward the west, three looking toward the south, and three looking toward the east. The sea was set upon them, and all their back parts pointed inward. So this brazen sea, which held about 2,000 baths, it was for the priest's ceremonial cleansing. So as they, and then, then Solomon, as you read through this, which is, it just depends on how you look at it. It can be very boring, but if you're looking for the types and the shadows, right, as a, for lack of a better term, as a preterist, we're, we're looking for types and shadows, okay? So now we're not just reading through here haphazardly and trying to, Drudge our way through Second Chronicles. No, no, no. We're looking for the types and the shadows because now we're educated. We know to look for these things because everything under the law is typological of something under the new covenant. <clears throat> so it can be, um, it can get bogged down. It can be a boring read. However, if you're reading this, to try to somehow see the types and shadows under the law, then it becomes a little bit more exciting because as soon as you see a type and you make that connection, you get excited because you found some little gold nugget in the Word of God that you hadn't seen before. So there were also a bunch of labors that Solomon had made, had cast and built. Not he himself, but he had them made. Well, the sea, the brazen sea and then these labors were for the priests' ceremonial cleansing. So they would come into the temple and they would have to change their clothing. They would have to bathe themselves. That's a baptism. And then they would have to, they, uh, they would have, to have these, these labors full of water that they got from the brazen sea. And they would cleanse the utensils. They would cleanse... The sacrifices they would cleanse all kinds of things so there was there was all kinds of these baptisms it calls it here but this is just nothing more than what's the LSB say does it say baptisms as well let me consult here 
The washings. It says teaching about washings. So they had to wash things under the law. Let me give you an example. Let's go over to Exodus 29, and verse 4. And all of this was typological because it pointed to something greater in the New Covenant. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's look at um, Exodus 29 and 4 where he says there that Aaron and his sons, you shall bring to the door the tabernacle of meeting and you shall wash them with water. Aaron and his sons. So Moses had to do this. Now this is the very, very, very beginning of the priesthood. So Moses was showing Aaron and his sons how God instructed him to cleanse themselves. And then when you go to verse 17, so look at Exodus 29, 17. They shall cut uh, the ram in pieces and wash its entrails. You see the washings under the law? Now they've washed themselves and now they're washing the sacrifices. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 9. And I'm not, this is not a, a comprehensive study. I'm just showing you some of the washings that they went through under that old covenant law. So Leviticus 9 and 14. Here again, um, we have uh, the priests ministering before the altar in the temple. And they slaughter the calf. They kill the burnt offering. And look what they do in verse 14. And he washed the entrails and the legs and he burned them with the burnt offering on the altar. So there's, there's some washings. Look at chapter 11 and verse 25. Leviticus 11 and verse 25. <clears throat> so this is about unclean animals. And it says, whoever carries part of the carcass of any of them, these unclean animals, shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. So we get an idea that there were all kinds of teachings about washings under the law. The priests had to wash themselves. They had to wash their clothes. They had to wash the sacrifices. If you touched an unclean animal, then you had to wash yourself. Um, there, were, there were just all kinds of washings under the law. Also, so he says we've got to leave these things. All right. Because they're no longer to practice Judaism. These things pointed to a reality in Christianity that was now a part of the kingdom. They were to practice the reality of those things, not the shadow of those things. Does that make sense? Okay, so then he says of the laying on of hands. All right, well, that's under the law. So... Under the law, you had, for example, look at Leviticus. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 16. You have all kinds of laying on of hands under the law. And most of it was done by the priesthood. So if you look at uh, Leviticus 16 and verse 21, this is still regarding the offerings. Leviticus 16, 21. All there? All found. Okay. It says, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away to the wilderness by the hand of uh, a suitable man. All right. This is just one of the instances of the laying on of hands. This is the transference ceremonially to the scapegoat. 
So the high priest had to do this. Let's look at. Um, well, this, okay. This is part of Yom Kippur. Yes. Yep. Let's look at uh, 24, Leviticus 24, and verse 14. Good thing I have my notes because I could never remember all of this. <coughs> I live and teach by notes, by the way. I'm, I'm not a smart person. I have to have a note yeah. <laughs> because my brain is just not big enough to hold all this information. That's what they taught us in the academy. <laughs> yeah, take good notes. So, um, Leviticus 24, 14. So, here is the penalty for blasphemy. But notice verse 14. Um, take outside the camp him who has cursed, and let all who hear him do what? Lay their hands on his head and let all the congregation stone him. The laying on of hands. Why was this done? This was done as a transference of the guilt of the sin onto the individual who committed the sin. So a lot of times they were held liable as a corporate entity. You remember the sin of Achan in Joshua chapter 7 where um, he stole the, the gold wedges and the silver and the garments? Remember that? And uh, then they go up to Ai and they're defeated at Ai. And right away Joshua knows, oh, there's a malfunction. There's something wrong here. And so he falls on his face because the sons of Israel died at Ai, and he immediately knows there's something wrong. And God tells him, look, you have sinned. You, plural, the, the nation. So because they were a corporate body, God held them all accountable. Okay, so then... You go back today and read Joshua 7 about Ai. And he, he accuses them. Israel has sinned. Well, it wasn't Israel per se. It was Achan. He was the only one that sinned. But because of his relationship, right, we're all members of one another. And because he sinned, now he's holding the nation accountable. And they had to purge the sin. And you remember what happened? So God revealed to, them, uh, to uh, Joshua who it was and they came forward and remember the, the earth opened up and consumed Achan he was, he was destroyed and uh, he, he died so you have this idea especially here in Leviticus 24 Of, uh, lay, the laying on of hands, the conference of either blessing or curses. And that's all throughout the Old Testament. A lot of the laying on of the hands was done by the priests uh, when an individual sinned in the nation and they were going to get rid of him, they would lay their hands on him, take him outside the city because he was soon going to be a dead body, right? And they couldn't, if they touched a dead body, then they would be unclean until evening. So they themselves would have to go through the purification ritual. So here is the laying on of hands. And that was for the conference of either a blessing or a curse. Now, the resurrection of the dead. So we have a topic. Let's see. Cooperate. <laughs> it's not. So we have a... Um, We have a meeting coming up. We have a lectureship coming up in August. We've got people coming. Um, some people I contacted in Colorado. There's a guy coming out from Colorado. There's people coming from Fresno. There's people coming from Clovis. I hope I can get some people 
from Springville. Uh, we're going to talk about the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. So where is this in the Old Covenant law? Someone would say, oh, well, no, 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 this is purely New Covenant. You're wrong. This is purely New Covenant. No, they're wrong. This is not New Covenant. Because there's nothing new about the New Covenant. We believe, well, let me ask you this. Do you believe, have you heard the statement, and do you believe the statement, that the old is the new concealed, and the new is the old revealed? Have you heard that statement before? Do you believe that? Because I do. I believe that. Okay. I think it was Martin Luther who stated that. I think. Don't quote. But you can ask Siri or Google. Google it. It was one of the reformers. And I think that's a true statement. That the old is the new concealed. And that the new is the old Reveal. If that be true, and I believe it is, then there's nothing new in the new covenant. Do you understand what I'm saying? It was all spoken of before. It was just concealed. And now it's revealed. Okay. So, there's no new eschatology in the New Testament. It's all old covenant eschatology. And that's what he's dealing with here, the resurrection of the dead. That's eschatology. Eternal judgment. That's eschatology. So, the book of Hebrews is about eschatology, in part. So, the resurrection of the dead. Where is this found? Well, it's, it's found in several different places. When you go back to, let's go back to Isaiah. Isaiah 25. Now, I'm going to have Holger Neubauer deal with Isaiah 25 and Isaiah 26. Those are resurrection chapters. And I told him, and he does an excellent job on this. There's probably no one better than I know of. And I've read almost every book on eschatology that I can get my little hands on. <clears throat> Holger does an excellent job. He is an excellent preacher. He is an excellent Bible scholar, as far as I'm concerned. He does a great job. And every, every man that's going to be at this um, lectureship is excellent in their field. So we look at Isaiah 25, and look at verse 8, because this is quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. That he will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away tears from all eyes. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. That's resurrection. He will swallow up death forever. Well, when death is swallowed up, that's when the resurrection occurs. Let's turn over to chapter 26. And... Notice, as we, as we come down to verse 17 of Isaiah 26, 17, let's just take a little bit of time and look at this. I'll show you where resurrection is found in the Old Covenant. Look what the, the prophet says, Isaiah 26, 17. Are we all there? As a woman with child is in pain and cries out in her pains. When she draws near the time of her delivery, so have we been in your sight, O Lord. Okay. So what is the prophet acknowledging here? He's acknowledging that Israel is like this woman who is pregnant and she's in travail. And she's crying out in her birth pains. When she draws near for the time of delivery. So the prophet is acknowledging that Israel could not bring forth uh, her own deliverance from the state of sin. All they could do was travail like a woman about ready to give birth. But that she, Israel as a nation could not deliver herself from the effects and the bondage of sin. 
Now watch, let's read on. Verse 18. We have been with child. We have been in pain. So, of course, this is an analogy. Okay. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. So she's pregnant, but she can't bring forth anything. She can't deliver herself. And thus Isaiah says, we brought forth the wind. Why? Because of the bondage of sin. This is a, this is a word picture here. Nothing about this is literal. This is, a, this is a poetic word picture about her condition in her sin. Let's read on. So he says, we, uh, we brought forth wind. We have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth. She realizes she's like this pregnant woman, but the, this pregnant woman cannot bring forth anything. It's like the child is stuck in the birth canal. All right. Does that make sense? Now, now watch this. We have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. So Israel was groaning in the pain of sin, but she could not bring forth this child. She could not bring forth any kind of deliverance. Now, any woman knows, right? You women know. As soon as the child is born, the pain goes away, correct? And joy comes. You've got this child, right? And you, you now you're, you're making a bond to it. The pain goes away. And that's the idea here. But because Israel could not deliver the pain of sin, her sin and her rebellion could not go away. She could not deliver that's the idea here. In verse 19, watch this. Here's resurrection. Your dead shall live. Let that soak in. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Okay. <clears throat> Isaiah was part of a corporate body, was he not? Corporate Israel. He was a Jew under the law. And he's saying here, Israel's like this pregnant woman who has a child stuck in the birth canal. She, she, she's at the time of labor, but the child won't come out. She can't deliver herself, and the pain is still there. So we know that when the child is born, the pain goes away, and the joy of the child now is with the mother and the father. But that's not the case in Israel. The, the child is stuck. She, the child can't come out. That's just a word picture. And he says, your dead shall live together with my dead body. Now, Isaiah's dead body was a corporate body. He's not talking about his physical body because do dead men write letters? <laughs> they don't write physical letters, right? You follow me? Dead men don't write physical letters. Isaiah was writing a physical letter to the nation of Israel. So this is not physically dead. He's talking about spiritually dead. They're dead in their sin. He was physically alive as he wrote his book. But he says, your dead shall live. He doesn't mean they're physically dead. What, he, what he's talking about here is they, Israel as a corporate body was stuck in sin death and she could not deliver herself. <clears throat> Therefore she was in travail like a woman who had a child stuck in the birth canal. And he says, your dead shall live together with my dead body. Now, my dead body does not mean his individual physical body because Israel is corporate. It's a corporate body that is in view here. So together with my dead body, they, there's your corporate, because the entire nation of dead men, they shall arise. And then he says, awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. Okay, dwelling in the dust is a Hebraic term for being downtrodden or in a state of humility or being in a state of defeat. Job himself said that he was in the dust. Job, if you want to take a note, look at Job 16, 15. Let's go there. <clears throat> Four, uh, Psalms, Job sixteen fifteen. All right, 
All there, Job 16, 15. I have sewn sackcloth over my skin and laid my head in the dust. Was Job in a state of humility and downtroddenness? Yeah, in his condition he was. But he wasn't dead. But he dwelt in the dust. Okay. So if you'll get your concordance out, all you have to do is look in the dust. You look at uh, any Bible program, type in the dust or the dust. And it'll bring up many, many, many scriptures about being in the dust. It's nothing more than a Hebraic idiom for someone who is downtrodden in a state of humility or who has been uh, cast down. Being in the dust. I'll give you another example. So, 1 Samuel chapter 2. <clears throat> this is where Hannah, she's trying to have a child. So remember in 1 Samuel 1, Hannah took a vow. Remember what she said? Lord, if you give me a child, I'm going to dedicate him to your service. He's going to become a Nazarite. Remember that? So the Lord looks down and he blesses Hannah and allows her to have this child. And notice, I want you to notice here. So to a Jewish woman who could not have a child, that meant that she was dead. It's a word picture. She's not literally dead, but she has a dead womb. And to a Jewish woman in that culture and in that time, she's dead. Look what she says, chapter 2. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. This is because God said, look, I'll let you have a child. You, you told me you're going to dedicate him, so now I'm going to bless you. You're going to be with child. So she says, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies. Because I rejoice in your salvation. <clears throat> so to a Jewish woman, to have a child was to be redeemed, was to be saved in a sense. You just look at, at what Hannah says. Verse 2, no one is holy like the Lord. For there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. So she's speaking truth here. Look what she says in verse 4. Let's keep reading. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumble are uh, girded with strength. So there's a reversal of circumstances. The bows of the mighty being broken, and those people who are stumbling... Now they're girded with strength. Do you see the, the word picture that she's using here? Verse 5. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. That's reversal, right? Watch this. And the hungry have ceased to hunger. So when she conceived in her womb, now she's using these word pictures. Aha! I have reversal of my circumstances. I was hungry, but I ceased to hunger. And those who had much are now in hunger. Let's watch this. Even the barren, I'm at the end of verse 5. Even the barren has borne seven. Well, she didn't have seven children. But seven to the Hebrew mind is, is a number of what? Completeness. What was it? Completeness? Who else said perfection. perfection? Perfection and completeness. Exactly. So just look how Hannah uses these terms. Even the barren has borne seven. Not that she had seven children, but what she's saying is, now I am perfect. My womb is open. I can have a child, and God has blessed me. And she who has many children has become feeble. So all of this is Hebraic idiom for the reversal of circumstances. 
Look at verse 6. This is about resurrection, folks. Look what Hannah says. The Lord kills and the Lord makes alive. Now, Hannah's womb was dead, but he blessed it and it came to life. Watch this. He brings down to the grave. Was she literally in the grave? No. But she might as well have been because to Hannah, she was as good as dead if she couldn't have a child. He brings down to the grave and brings up. Is that resurrection? It sure is. To a Jewish woman who is barren of child, when she's allowed to have a child, she considers herself to be resurrected. You just look at the words of Hannah. Now watch this. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from where? What does your Bible say? From the dust. What are we talking about here? She's dwelling in the dust. He raises the poor from the dust and he lifts the beggar from the ash heap. To set them among princes and to make them inherit the, the throne of glory. None of this is literal. But these are all Hebraic idioms and they're word pictures. They're poetic word pictures used to show a reversal of circumstances. So Hannah says, You're, I, I'm in the dust, but now I'm raised up. I was in the grave, now I'm raised up. I was poor, now I'm rich. See. So in the dust, in the dust, let's come back to Isaiah 26. <clears throat> and it took me a little while to search all of this out, but I wanted to know how the Hebrews, how the ancient writers of the Bible use the term. So you either, if you have a Bible program, you can do this. If you have a concordance, you can do the same thing. And I'm not saying every time that it says in the dust, it doesn't, it, it's, it's used in a poetic way. I'm not saying that because a lot of times it is not, it is used in a literal way too. But many, many times it is used in the poetic way in the dust, in the dust, down to the dust. You'll find that over and over and over again. You'll find it in the Psalms. You'll, you'll find it in Isaiah. You'll find Hannah used it that way. It's a hyperbolic term, in the dust. So when we have a prophet, Isaiah the prophet, in Isaiah 26 and verse 19, talking about uh, that my dead body shall arise, awake and sing you who dwell in the dust, <clears throat> That the way the prophets use this term, the dust, is the same way that Hannah used it. Because they weren't in the dust, literally in the dust. They weren't literally dead, but they were in sin death. And at some point, when Messiah came, your dead men would live. And those who dwell in the dust shall arise. So that's resurrection. Uh, and, and notice um, he says at the end of verse 19, for your dew is like the dew of herbs. What does this mean? It simply means, uh, you know what, what's the, how does the LSB put it? I want to look at that for just a second. It might be, there might be a more literal render. Let me, uh, Scott, you have it open yeah. there. Uh, How, what does it say there? For in, your, uh, verse 19. Where am I? Twenty. I'm in twenty six nineteen. Yes. Yeah, okay. So twenty six nineteen says, "Your dead will live; their corpses will rise. You will dwell on the dust, awake and shout for joy, for your dew is as the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits." Okay. <clears throat> so here's an alter, alternate rendering. So you 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 take this. Uh, and you take the either the King James or the New King James, and you're going to have the totality of what the scriptures teach on this topic here. So what you have here is when he says that your dew is like the dew of herbs or the, uh, 
the LSB says do of the your dawn. due is as the due of the dawn. The due there's at the dawn, there is in the morning before the sun dawns, the there's condensation that comes upon the herb or the plant. Have you ever gone up early in the morning and you're in tall grass and there's it's all wet? Okay. That is a Hebraic idiom for healing. When I say, as a Hebrew, when I say your dew is like the dew of the dawn, or the other rendering in the New King James is your dew is like the dew of herbs. The dew on herbs, they were they they didn't have pharmaceuticals like we do today. They used herbs for healing. It's the same thing. It's a Jewish or Hebraic idiom used for healing. Okay. So when he says your dew is like the dew of the dawn or the dew of herbs, depending on what version you're using, all that signifies is healing. Okay. So now Jesus, the, in, in the resurrection, there is healing that takes place. It's like the dew being uh, the dew of herbs or the dew of the dawn. There is healing in that. And the earth shall cast out the dead, the New King James says. And, but this, uh, the legacy standard says, the earth will give birth to departed spirits. Okay, so we have the emptying of the Hadean realm. Now, the Jews thought that Sheol was deep in the pit, deep in the pit of the earth. Well, it would be no, there, it would, it would be no stretch here to understand this statement where it says that uh, the earth will give birth to departed spirits. This is the idea in the resurrection. The departed spirits are coming up out of the pit because that's where the Jew thought the Hadean realm was, under the earth. And I'll give you an example. Remember in Matthew 12 where Jesus said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And there shall, be, shall, there shall be no sign given to it except for the sign of the son of, of, of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights where? In, in the, the heart of the earth. Because the Jews believed that Hades was in the heart of the earth. Okay. <clears throat> that proves Isaiah 26, 19. These departing spirits coming from the earth are coming from the Hadean realm. That's the resurrection. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so uh, I've taken too long on this. But I want to show you. I just want to show you kind of a picture of what the Old Testament teaches about resurrection of the dead. And this was not a new covenant doctrine exclusively. This, the resurrection of the dead, had been dealt with by the Old Testament prophets already. And so I just want to show you that. So I will, what we'll do, Lord willing, next week is we'll look at Daniel 12. Because Daniel 12 is... The other Old Testament resurrection texts. There are there are many more, but we're, we'll look at these two. We'll look at Isaiah 25 and 26 and Daniel chapter 12. Once we do that, you'll see, aha, so the Old Testament did speak about the resurrection of the dead. It was just concealed at the time. And now that the new covenant has come, now it's being revealed. Okay, so I hope that that makes sense. Any comments?